But at our university, we were never totally locked down. We always had people working, sometimes only half of the um, half half of the you know uh, staff. Uh, at one point, only a quarter because we had to be distanced and so forth, and and we are wearing masks and so forth. So. Um, So our lab was uh, uh, affected a lot. So we had to shut down research here. And only uh, the students of Dr. Tariq were allowed to come and they were flipping the fly stocks and maintaining so our fly lab doesn't collapse. So that was, uh, so Dr. Tariq said. Yeah. Hi, hey, hey, well, I'm fine. How, you? How are you doing? So nice to see you. <laughs> we are doing well, actually. Uh, Germany somehow is is doing fine, uh, keeping control. Even though today, um, you know, if you say how are you, everybody immediately thinks of Corona, right? <laughs> <laughs> this is the way these days it happens. Um, um, no, I think we are we are doing okay. And personally, also, I've been in the institute every single day, actually, to because I somehow felt someone has to, you know, show that uh, we are not totally shut down. Um, but actually we are doing research and doing the worst time we were even able to revise a paper. So, you know, some people were always allowed to come to the lab. Of course, the regulations were strict, but um, yeah, it's okay. So your lab did not uh, shut down. So like we had really six months of inactivity, except we were allowed to just flip our fly stocks, keep them alive. Yeah, no, we were not totally shut down, even though, of course, there was a point when uh, half or, or even uh, two thirds of the staff went into home office. And so the PhD students started to write the introduction of a thesis and some people anyway had to do informatics and some people, uh, um, you know, began to draft a manuscript and so forth. So somehow it kind of sorted out. Yeah. Uh -huh. and, and now I would say um, most people are back, but, but, and so we've established what we call contact groups. So within a group, uh, you know, we, we don't need to wear a mask in that room. But as soon as you go out into more general areas, you wear a mask, you keep your distance and so forth. So the idea is um, as soon as um, there's some infection, we would be able to localize it. Yeah. And, but in our whole institute of about 400 or so members of staff, so far we had three cases and they were immediately quarantined and there was no spreading and so forth. So. That was actually pretty good, I think. So all 400 are allowed to come same day. So we have a different strategy here now. Yeah. Well, um, this depends on the, the teams and it depends on the groups. Um, you know, we have to keep our distance of one meter 50 or something like that. And yeah. so in some parts we are taking turns and also for very sensitive areas like the, the, the animal facility, we have different teams that don't meet each other and and so forth. Um, so we have a plan as well. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah. So here, although we were uh, lucky, we are very lucky. Corona did not have that bad impact on, in Pakistan. Uh, yeah. So far, we are doing pretty good. But yeah. still, uh, our university, we went nearly six months, complete lockdown. We only few people were allowed. And so Jawad yeah. and Najma, they were allowed to come and flip our stocks. Uh, rest of the department was almost nobody was allowed to enter. Uh, now we have this phased or, you know, SOP based opening where we have alternate days when people come. 50% uh, mm -hmm. of the people come one day, the others come on the other day. And now I think we will be entering into phase two of uh, inviting people on campus in which, uh, you know, additional, I think 
150 to 200 more people will be allowed to enter in our school. Uh, yeah. So we were fighting back actually quite tough with our university that we don't have uh, that bad impact in Pakistan. Uh, yeah. But but I should also say that all our teaching is uh, by Zoom at this point. So we are teaching medical students like many hundred and everything is virtual. So we, we changed all our curriculum to, to video conferencing and so forth. And we, we videotaped uh, lectures and so forth. So um, our place, our campus looks deserted uh, as compared to normal. So, and also I should say in our labs, I think the lab space is relatively generous. So we don't have four people. We never have four people in a bay, but usually only two, two to three, and then the two can keep their distance somehow. And so I think we are not so crowded. That's perhaps the other mm -hmm. message. Mm. Yeah, same as here. So our teaching is also fully online. Uh, yeah. And it's, it's uh, quite challenging, especially when you have to conduct exams uh, for undergrads. That is tricky. Uh, yeah. How to manage, you know. So, so we had um, we had a situation where we have a huge lecture hall that seats a thousand. So we had some people come, like 150 were able to come, and the others um, uh, had to do it by Zoom and had to videotape themselves <laughs> with their mobile phones from behind, so you could see the hands and yeah. the, the 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 monitors. Uh, and then there's huge discussion whether that is should be allowed or whether that's illegal, because you're 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 videotaping some aspect of the private homes, you know. So we are not allowed to, you know, to survey the room or whatever. So there are all these arguments about. Uh, <coughs> sorry about legal issues. Yeah. Yeah, we, we are facing same challenges, how to monitor, you know, uh, students with exams. So like on Sunday, we have exam of undergrads and we have asked them that they have to come on Zoom and keep the camera on. Uh, and, you know, these are unusual times. Uh, some of the students did complain that what do you want to see by having cameras on? Yeah, that, that's actually I, exactly right, because you don't see their monitors. Yeah. Because they're having their, their chat uh, forum and whatever. Uh, I mean, we have seen this. People had different chat groups and yeah. some people take care of the first two questions and other people take care of the second two questions and then they just... So, anyway. So good to know we are not the only ones struggling with this thing. No. Everybody, everybody does. Yeah. yeah. Of course. yeah. So... Um, so who, who will be listening today? Is this uh, the fly community or, or anybody or so? Just, so we just... have, uh, so whole, I, I can see whole department is logging in. People are coming in. So we have a faculty, uh, like I can see Dr. Safiullah Chaudhary is there. He is a, a computational biologist, computational cancer mm -hmm. system biologist. Uh, Amir Faisal, he is presently chair of uh, our department. He is cancer therapeutics, but uh, uh, you know he is expert in cell signaling, basically. And then uh, I can also see Rahman Shahzeb Salim is logged in. He is from Department of Chemistry, so it, it's pretty much. And then all the students are coming in from all over department. So molecular cell biology students are there, uh, undergrads are there, grads are there, PhDs are there, uh, postdoc is also there. So it's it's for everybody and then on uh, via zoom we are also live on facebook so as i told you we have uh, very few opportunities for such distinguished speakers so it's pretty much a giant zooming uh, going all over pakistan but here on zoom live you have the whole department and even chemistry faculty is also there shazeb always joins us there that's very nice so uh, can I assume that that some techniques like chip or attack seek are are they known in general or to most? Yeah, chip seek is known to uh, mm -hmm. most. I would say, except Shazeb, maybe all the others will uh, have an idea about chromatin immunoprecipitation, which we call chip, and then followed by next generation sequencing. Attack seek may not be 
familiar with all except maybe <clears throat> only the epigenetics people who who knows this okay so that's good to know mm -hmm. yeah so this this is uh, actually so zoom also gives us new opportunities i mean i would you know traveling to pakistan this, this is a big thing but um zooming is a small thing and we even had uh, like journal we transformed our journal clubs because in the past you know in a journal club someone someone would present a paper and you would discuss it now you can actually ask the first author of the paper why don't you zoom in and explain and we discuss with you and these are very often phd students or postdocs and they really love the opportunity to present their paper and i think this is something that we will keep you know even if we we are allowed to travel again because so we are we are practicing new formats of communication i think it's very nice actually i agree with you it's a it's a blessing in disguise uh, it's a it's a totally mm. new opportunity which none of us uh, thought about usually i am uh, not so technology savvy i you know but zoom really gave us uh, opportunity to to get connected and for us in pakistan having you or susan gasser or you know stefan all these people who are uh, kind enough to get connected with us for us it it has totally different meaning for us it's a totally new world because our students be it undergrad grad and post grad students uh, even the faculty we have now uh, just on a click away you know the the uh, amble talks or you know mm -hmm. fmi talks these things which, which was not possible earlier so corona is a blessing in disguise as well i call it i think the main problem is if you survey all the institutes and the talks that they put online you can spend your entire day listening yeah. to such talks and yeah. and at one point it becomes too much of a temptation even and it even so so we are getting back into inviting people by zoom via zoom also but you can see it adds up and then people are zooming all day long so yeah. we also yeah. make have to make sure we get our work done somehow yeah yeah so i think we are getting there let's let me introduce you should we start then i first introduce and then i hand over to you shall i so, share my screen already or yeah you can start sharing and i can introduce thank you so it's a real player uh, that we have professor dr peter becker with us uh, professor becker is a highly accomplished scientist and uh, one of the finest biochemists in the field of chromosome biology and gene regulation so presently uh, peter is serving as chair of biomedical center at lmu munich uh, he also uh, serves on a number of scientific advisory boards of uh, different prestigious institutes, for example, Max Planck Institute for Molecular Biomedicine, Institute for Molecular Biology, uh, Mainz, uh, Biochemistry Center uh, in Heidelberg, uh, and also represent German Ministry for Education and Research in uh, European Molecular Biology Council. Uh, Peter is also elected member of the Bavarian Academy of Sciences. Uh, he is also elected member of German Academy of Science, uh, Leopoldina, and also the elected member of Academia Europea uh, and an elected member of EMBO, um, which is European Molecular Biology Organization. Uh, Peter is a, re a recipient of one of the highest and prestigious uh, honors uh, in German research, which is Wilhelm Leibniz Prize uh, by Deutsche Forschung Gemeinschaft, and also Rixenhain uh, Prize for Cancer Research uh, from DKFZ Heidelberg. Peter also serves as uh, ed editorial board members uh, of uh, nucleic acid research, EMBO, uh, PLOS Biology, and EMBO reports. So with that, uh, I hand it over to Peter. Peter, it's a real pleasure to see you and uh, to hear about genetic and epigenetic mechanisms of X chromosome inactivation in Drosophila. Over to you. Thank you very much, Muhammad, um, for having me. The pleasure is really on my side. Um, 
uh, as we just said, uh, Corona gives um, new opportunities and uh, I will enjoy, I'm looking forward to presenting our latest research and discussing a fascinating problem in biology with you. Um, I think the good thing about Zoom is also if you if you find it boring, you can just log off, right? <laughs> and, and so, <laughs> okay, um, let me start with this uh, spectacular pictures. I, I, I still like them every time I show them. What this shows you is the Drosophila chromosomes, either as polytene chromosomes or as interface nucleus or as metaphase chromosomes. And they are stained with a transcription activator, either in green or in red. And so what you can see is that the transcription activator selectively binds to one chromosome, which happens to be the X chromosome. So the transcription activator only activates the X chromosome. And we find this a fascinating problem. Now it turns out this process of activating many genes on the X chromosome only happens in male flies because male flies only carry a single X chromosome. And it's the single X chromosome that is activated. Genomes are very well balanced systems of gene expression and function. And so the females have two X chromosomes, their um, genome, their biology is perfectly balanced, but the males somehow have to compensate for the fact that they only have a single X. And in fact, if they fail to do so, this is a lethal condition. Um, the activation of transcription on the single X chromosome is in the twofold range to make up for the reduced X chromosome dosage. And so this process is called dosage compensation. So a failure to compensate in that tiny twofold range is a lethal condition for the flies. And uh, this gives you a genetic readout, male specific lethality. And so there were generations of geneticists uh, that identified the components of this dosage compensation system. Before we get to that, uh, let me illustrate um, the interesting biological question here. So uh, there are a thousand genes, let's say, on the X chromosome, and they're all subject to the same type of regulation. How does this work? Genes that are highly expressed, lowly expressed, developmental, housekeeping genes, and so forth. The activation, the, the regulation, is restricted to the X chromosome. Um, so th there is an, an exquisite selectivity of action. Uh, which we are trying to explain, obviously. And then there is this modulation of activity in the twofold range. And I think it is still a mystery how you can achieve such a fine balancing. Um, this, as you will see, is a genetic process, but it's also, it has an epigenetic component. Because if you take any gene from elsewhere in the genome on an autosome and insert it to the X chromosome, it will be subject to the same activation, to the same regulation. So um, th there's nothing specific about the genes on the X, they are just genes, uh, but it has to do with the X chromosome and the fact that they are localized on the X chromosome. So, here are the components of the transcription activator um, that have been identified by genetic screens for male specific lethality. They are called the male specific lethal proteins, MSL. MOF is males absent on the first, on the X chromosome. And then there is maleless, the helicase. So these five proteins along with non-coding RNA, that is called ROCs, form a complex in male cells. In female cells, several of these components here, 
are also present and they may form complexes, but with totally different function. The male specific component is MSL2. And this is the protein that I think I will be talking mostly about. The male, this is expressed only in male cells at the time when the male sex is determined. And then there is this long non-coding RNA called ROX that if I have time, I will get to a bit later or at towards the end. So once these male specific components are expressed, they organize the remainder of the proteins into this dosage compensation complex. So uh, I will be telling you about our uh, latest research. So things that we've published during the past uh, year or so, one or two years. But of course, we are building on decades of research in this process, uh, on this process, initially by geneticists, uh, but by a lot of molecular biology. Um, the field is relatively small. There's probably a dozen labs uh, that are interested in this. So here's how we think it works. Uh, this shall be the X chromosome here. And the X chromosome has binding sites for the dosage compensation complex, which we call the high affinity sites because we think that's what it is. They have high affinity, but they have also been called the chromosomal entry sites because these are the, are the first point of entry of this dosage compensation complex. And so we think this complex binds first to these sites and thereby is recruited to the X chromosome. And it then some somehow reaches out to the active genes in the nuclear environment. And they could be close linearly or in, in space. And uh, then they activate the genes. And uh, here is how we think this works. Uh, the genetic component is that there are these high affinity sites and they are defined by DNA sequence. And uh, the, the um, finding is that these high affinity sites are enriched on the X chromosome. And it is, as you will see, quite a challenge to identify the X chromosome specificity. So the complex has a DNA binding surface, MSL2, interestingly, the male specific component. But then it needs to reach out to the active genes. And I said, there's nothing special about these genes. They are just active. And here comes the epigenetic aspect of it. These genes are marked by a histone modification, methylation of lysine 36 of histone H3. And this is a mark that is placed co-transcriptionally. So it marks active genes. Now, the dosage compensation complex has a component here MSL3 that contains a chromo barrel domain that is able to recognize this methyl mark. And the idea that has been substantiated but not fully proven, in particular, we don't know whether that's all there is or there is something else. The idea is that the dosage compensation complex has an epigenetic reader and writer module. The reader module reads the K36 methyl mark, and the writer is the histone acetyltyl transferase MOF that places uh, acetylation of lysine 16 of histone H4. Now, this is a, if you wish, a strategic modification that is known to somehow lead to the unfolding of the chromatin fiber. And the idea is, and again, um, uh, lots of evidence, but not totally proven, that this is, the, I mean, I think it's clear this is the activating principle. I think there's no doubt about this. Now, the problem with this is that MOF will not automatically lead to a twofold activation of transcription. Actually, if you recruit MOF to some places, it will activate um, in the tenfold range much higher. And so the mystery that we have not resolved yet is how 
levels are adjusted to twofold. We hypothesize that there must be antagonists, repressive uh, proteins or principles that somehow counteract the much larger activation by MOF. And during the course of the years, we have actually tested one or two, uh, one in particular, and then others we just looked into, and we have not found the repressive principle. So there is still an interesting uh, question there. So the MSL2 protein is the DNA binding protein. Interestingly, it's also a ubiquitin ligase. And so somehow ubiquitination plays a role in all of this. We published several years ago that we think that one of the functions of ubiquitination is to keep the levels of this dosage compensation complex uh, constant and at a appropriate level, because we also know that if you overexpress the components, the complex will move to the autosomes after it has saturated the X chromosome, will move to autosomes and then begin to regulate autosomes. So we think this is a intrinsically very quantitative system and ubiquitination may play a role. MSL1 is a scaffolding process. It also presumably serves to dimerize the complex. There is an RNA helicase in here called MALES that we think serves to remodel the non-coding RNA and to incorporate the RNA into a complex. Um, the significance I will try to get to at the very end if there's time, but is not resolved at this point. And then comes the epigenetic uh, reader-writer module that I just mentioned. So if any of those proteins is mutated, uh, the, the dominant phenotype that the geneticists see is male-specific lethality. But there are also other more subtle effects in females, in particular, if you mutate the female-specific proteins. Now, it is not clear at all why there is lethality. If you take tissue culture cells, Drosophila Schneider cells that grow in culture, um, they are not affected if you delete or uh, deplete these proteins which is nice because you can actually use that system to explore the biology. Um, and you can see the genes are uh, not activated anymore, the twofoldness and so forth, but they don't die. So there is presumably a developmental aspect to this. Now, it is um, clear from work from Irma Chopur um, and Jörg Müller that um, the, the problem, if, if you lack all the dosage compensation, the problem resides in these earliest stages of uh, Drosophila development. The males die somewhere here at gastrulation. So essentially, uh, when the, the genome is fully activated and morphogenesis is in full, uh, in full function and you need all the genes activated and so forth. Now, we, uh, we looked into this in a bit more detail, uh, trying to find out whether we can spot the moment when dosage compensation is absolutely important. And so what we have done is we've taken um, uh, embryos from these stages here, roughly stage three to four, which is you know like two hours into development, to stage 15, which is about 10, 12 hours into development. And we carefully staged single embryos and then did an RNA sequencing analysis. So we established the transcriptome of these embryos. And um, in this uh, figure here to the right, you can actually see every dot is an embryo uh, and a transcriptome, if, if you so wish the colors indicate uh, the stages. So the more yellow, the earlier, the more darker blue, the later. This 
color code will be maintained during the next couple of figures. And each of these dots is a transcriptome. And in this uh, principal component analysis, you can actually compare the transcriptome and you can actually see that individual embryos of the same stage cluster together, they share a transcriptome. And so that tells us that we have done the staging well. And then, of course, we're interested to compare male and females. And so you can also now know from the transcriptome which are the male and which are the female embryos. And you see here the females in red and the males in blue. And so we have male and female embryos in all of the stages. And now we analyze uh, whether uh, the male X chromosomal genes are balanced. That is, whether they are twofold increased. Uh, and at the same level as the female genes, where both X chromosomes are active. And so here is how we are doing this. You see here again the stages in the color code. And let's first look at genes on the autosomes. Autosomes are and should be the same in males and females. And if, uh, if, the, um, if the values are around zero, that means the ratio of um, males and females are the same. And you can see genes on the autosomes are by and large uh, expressed to the same level in male and female cells. Now here are the X chromosomal genes and you see this is clearly not the case. They are more expressed um, in females. So the males are not fully compensated. And uh, there are several things that you can see from this. First, um, um, even after 12 to 15 hours or, of development, uh, there is barely compensation. But in the, in the early hours, in particular at the time when uh, the embryos die, it's not all the genes are compensated. On the other hand, full compensation, full I should say total absence of compensation would mean that you are in the range of uh, here, up here. So there is partial compensation somehow all the time. Okay, but not complete. So if we look at these X chromosomal genes and then we, uh, we stratify them into constitutive genes and developmental genes. Uh, by the way, this study has been published uh, uh, about a year ago, so you can read up on details. You can see that the constitutive genes tend to be compensated faster and more complete and developmental genes less so. We were kind of surprised because we kind of assumed such a quantitative system should be tight and should be complete, and it isn't. And on the other hand, if you think about it, that's okay. I mean, Presumably, it is not important that every single gene is exactly expressed at one particular level there in transcription. There are, of course, other ways to regulate post-transcriptional, uh, uh, translational control, complex formation, and so forth. So I guess what we are seeing here is the level of compensation that is nicely compatible with life without, um, without too much of an effort. So um, now, of course, we wanted to find out. Uh, so there is this, this gradual, gradual uh, improvement of compensation. And we want to find out, can we correlate this with any molecular events? And so we are monitoring aspects of the dosage compensation by chromatin immunoprecipitation, CHIP. Essentially, what we are doing is we are mapping the binding of these components and the histone modifications to the chromosomes, to the genes where they belong. And we have a long uh, experience with this chip. And again, this is not single embryo chip, but it is very carefully staged embryos. Um, because we cannot do this in single embryos, we group a couple of embryos. And so these are not totally well-defined. The early ones are stages five to eight. This is when there's clearly no complete dosage compensation. And however, this is the critical phase when embryos die. And then the later stages, 13 to 15. Now, 
Um, first, we are looking at MSL2 binding. So this is the contact here. And we can actually see where it touches down on DNA here. These are the hyper, uh, sorry, these are the high affinity sites. And then we see by the cross-linking that they inter it interacts, of course, with chromatin at the primary binding site, but also left and right. And if we compare early and late, you will probably agree there's not a big difference. Right? So we actually concluded that even early on, the binding of this complex is already fairly complete. And But then, of course, it could be that it has to do with active genes and uh, the active mark lysine 636 methylation. And so here you can see how the genes are, the active genes are marked by this epigenetic modification very nicely, the exons in particular. Um, but again, there is not a big difference early and late. So that is not the explanation. Now we look at MOF. MOF is the effector, MOF is the hat, MOF is the activator. And again, early and late, there was not much of a difference, right? Only when we looked at the activating mark, H4K16 acetylation, we observed a significant spreading and increase in ten of intensity at later stages. And I think you can see this here in the browser uh, screenshot. But of course, we can also see that computationally. So you can see here that, um, I'm sorry. Um, you, you can see here that lysine 16, lysine, lysine 36 methylation is the same early or late. MOF, the effector is approximately the same, but what really changes is lysine 16 acetylation, okay? So we conclude that the complex is there, but it, it, doesn't, it doesn't affect all genes equally well. Um, actually, you can see this also here on this cumulative plot. Here we have looked at all the genes on the X chromosome and at their promoters. It is a hallmark of dosage compensation that the coding regions of genes, so anything downstream, of uh, the transcription start site TF TSS is acetylated. And you can see there is a quite a significant increase of acetylation here uh, uh, in the gene body, but that's not the case on autosomal genes, right? Early and late are the same. This is actually a beauty of the dosage compensation system as a model to study fundamental principles of gene regulation you know, uh, targeting, activation, and so forth, because we can always compare a large number of genes on the X chromosome to a larger number of genes on the autosomes. And so this gives us statistical power, even when we are monitoring relatively small effects. So when we look at all the genes here, every dot is a gene, and see whether they gain H4K16 acetylation late versus early, we see that most genes somehow gain. But of course, the level of acetylation, high here, low there, differs a lot, right? And uh, uh, it's, we're not sure this is perfectly correlated to gene activity, actually. But we can identify genes that are acetylated heavily, strongly, robustly, early, and that gain. Uh, and those are actually the genes in cluster one. And um, it turns out those are the housekeeping genes. Now, remarkably, if we try to find out what is the difference between cluster one genes that are so robustly or more robustly dosage compensated to all the other ones, we find that it is the proximity to high affinity sites, to primary binding sites for the dosage compensation complex. A gene that is, you know, statistically speaking, 
better compensated is closer to the binding sites for the complex. And genes that are not so robustly acetylated, not so robustly uh, acetyl, uh, compensated, tend to be more distant to the, uh, to the high affinity binding sites. So here is my first summary. Dosage compensation takes time. It takes many hours, even though the lethal effect is observed early. Um, that tells us, first of all, we, don't, we still don't know why they die. It could be a single gene. It could be the general fitness at a very decisive time of development. And I'm not sure whether we'll ever find out, to be honest, because it's a systemic effect. Uh, secondly, uh, for some genes, obviously, it matters less. Right, okay, fine. Uh, there's probably biology is variable and so forth. So the dosage compensation correlates with the activating mark, but the complex is there long before. So what keeps it from acetylation? That's an interesting question. And here comes one clue, I think. The genes that are closer to the primary binding sites receive earlier and more robust H4K16 acetylation, and they are uh, compensated faster. So it must have to do with this process over here. The complex binds, but it reaches out to the genes. And the genes that are closer are somehow better substrates, right? So, um, Actually, um, it turns out that the time when dosage compensation is more and more complete is the time when the folding of the chromosomes is improved. And that has been most nicely shown by uh, Giacomo Cavalli recently, who monitored chromosome conformation and folding by high C. And there is a considerable tightness of folding at stages 13 to 15 versus 3 to 5, uh, or 5 to 8. So we think that the folding of the chromosome somehow brings distant genes together that are then also acetylated. And so the genes that are distant profit from the higher order uh, chromosome organization. And this is actually what is uh, written here. The genes that are constitutive, where you could argue it matters most that they are compensated, tend to be closer to the high affinity sites. And so there is an interesting correlation between developmental timing of dosage compensation and arrangement of genes on the X chromosome. Or you could also argue the other way around. The high affinity sites have been placed closer to those genes where it matters most. So there's an interesting evolu chromosome evolutionary twist somehow, right? And um, bottom line is, it is interesting to find out about the nature of these high affinity sites, the, the sites that are so important to target the X chromosome. And so I guess, most of what I'm going to tell you about next is about these um, high affinity sites. So um, here you can see again uh, how nicely the X chromosome is distinguished from the autosomes. And so this is a beautiful example for selective targeting of epigenetic regulators or genetic regulators, if you want. Uh, two specific sites. And we use this as a, as a model, uh, not just to sort out dosage compensation in Drosophila, that most people in the world don't care about this at all. But of course, many people care about enhancer-promoter interactions, where we also have a long range distant interaction. And many uh, people care about how transcription factors find their genuine binding sites even though there are so many confusing sequences in the genome. So the binding of the dosage compensation machinery to the X chromosome is mediated by MSL2, the only male specific protein. This also explains why in females, none of this interaction works. 
it is actually the male specific expression that generates this novel complex and uh, restricts the activation to the males. We think MSL2 is the only DNA binding protein, uh, but it requires MSL1 for productive uh, interaction in vivo, uh, not in vitro, as you will see. So the binding sites for MSL2 in vivo have been mapped by chromatin immunoprecipitation. We've spent decade, a decade on this. And um, the conclusion is uh, that there are about 300 of these high affinity sites. And they are littered all over the X chromosome. They are all found in the active compartment. They are all found relatively close to genes, very often in introns. And uh, you can, we can discuss, uh, if there's time later, how they may have evolved. Um, they are uh, identified by a relatively simple sequence. It is a G ray A rich element that you can see here. Now the problem is if you take this position weight matrix, this sequence here, and you search for it in the, in the Drosophila genome, there are 10,000s of binding sites all over the place in autosomes and X chromosomes. And it is totally unclear uh, why these sites should be specific to the X chromosome. And so for the past five years or so, we have actually spent time on trying to sort uh, out. And I'll give you a progress report today. I think we are making good headway, but um, we haven't totally solved it. But the problem is the same for many other transcription factors, uh, be it homeo, uh, hox, uh, homeobox uh, proteins and so forth. Their, their, their recognition sequences, where they bind to and footprint to, I found at many places in the genome where they do not bind in vivo. And it is a question of how do they find the specific sites and sort it out. So what I'm emphasizing here, don't worry about dosage compensation. We, we try to think about the bigger picture. So only about 2% of such sites recruit MSL2 or the dosage compensation complex to the X chromosome. So uh, in order to find out what the intrinsic of, uh, ability of MSL2 is to select DNA sequences. Uh, a couple of years ago, we um, used a method and applied a method called DNA immunoprecipitation, DIP. So in this kind of an experiment, we take genomic DNA, the total Drosophila genome. We shear it into small bits of about two, 300 base pairs. And they contain hopefully some specific binding sites. And then we add the MSL2 protein as a recombinant protein expressed in insect cells, allow it to bind and then immunoprecipitate and we sequence the associated DNA. So this is similar to CHIP. In CHIP, you would do the same thing with chromatin. It would usually be an in vivo chromatin. So it's called DIP DNA immunoprecipitation. And so, I was totally skeptical initially, but when uh, Rafaela Villa, who then published this paper, uh, did it, the, the first uh, browser screenshots were remarkable. Um, MSL2 in vitro was able to select specific sites from the genome in a totally competitive situation, right? And if you look at this kind of superficially, and you can also look at this here, uh, the, some of the peaks are really similar. Right, so it, it does the right thing. MSL2 actually, um, you know, is able to identify these sequences. And then when we looked at all the in vitro peaks, the, uh, the consensus sequence here, the position rate matrix was exactly like the in vivo one, right? And so we said, yes, we've done it. You know, we solved the problem, this is it. Now the problem came when we actually compared really the in vivo and the in vitro peaks. And the Venn diagram shows you this. Even though uh, MSL2 pulls out the same sequences, they are not the in vivo peaks. 
they are other peaks that look exactly the same. So obviously, uh, there's something really important missing. Now, the reason why this was published in Nature in the end was that the 57 here that are shared by in vitro and in vivo, these ones here, contain a very special and extended signature. In addition to the GAGA that we used to see, and that's present everywhere, uh, these 57 sites contain a five prime extension. And MSL2 via its CXC domain is able to specifically recognize this, what we call the Pionex signature. And the, there's also an interesting shape feature uh, inserted here because, you know, it's not just DNA sequence, it's a shape element as well. And because shape was very fashionable, fashionable at the time, uh, nature thought it was interesting. Now, these Pionex signatures are, you know, this is what MSL2 binds. And it, these are on the X chromosome. These were actually the first specific X chromosomal signatures. However, we are just explaining, I don't know, 20% of all the primary binding sites. And we are not explaining hundreds of other sequences on the X chromosome that are also somehow targeted. You know, these are statistical measures. We, we only give you this, the number of sequences above a certain threshold. But of course, there are, you know, sites of slightly lower affinity. And in fact, there are also Pionex signature sites that, uh, that are almost as good, but don't qualify. This is a statistical analysis. Anyway, so obviously something is missing. And we have in our analysis, lots of false negatives. That is many sites that we know are bound in vivo, but they are not bound in vitro. And then we have many sites that are bound in vitro that are not contacted in vivo. So uh, this is what we are trying to sort out. And so in a brainstorming, we came up with the following uh, possible contributors. So uh, there could be cooperation with other factors. I think there is, this is actually an overarching principle. Transcription factors are never by themselves. They're usually in, in enhancers where there are many other transcription factors left and right. And it's actually the cooperativity uh, between all these proteins that makes the difference. Any isolated uh, sequence, consensus sequence somewhere in the genome will presumably not be bound. It's just that we don't know the cooperating factors uh, with the dosage compensation. Secondly, of course, we considered a role for chromatin organization. The DIP was a naked DNA in vitro uh, you know, experiment. And um, in particular, we assume that many of these false positives, that is sites that are bound on DNA that are never contacted in vivo may be covered up by chromatin, right? And then, of course, we always have to remember, we only used a single protein, MSL2, that is usually part of a complex with non-coding RNA in it and so forth. And of course, it could well be that the complex has different properties and more specific binding activity than the individual MSL2 protein. So these are the things that we are going to test. Now, as regards the cooperation with other factors, there was actually an important hint that came from the lab of Erika Larshan, who also has an interest in dosage compensation. And she discovered while she was still with Mitzi Kuroda and then followed up the research in her own lab, a protein that she calls the CLAMP, chromatin-linked adapter for MSL proteins. So she said, if that clamp protein is mutated in a fly, uh, the dosage compensation complex cannot bind. Uh, this is something that at that time, actually, we had just shown that MSL2 can bind DNA and can recognize GAGA sequences and so forth. And so initially we were skeptical. Um, but as you will see, Erica had a point. Now, this protein here uh, contains a number of zinc fingers. Several of those are involved in binding GAGA sequences. And you can see that the consensus binding site of this 
protein is very similar to the what is called the MSL re recognition or response regulatory element, the GAGA sequence, the high affinity site. Right? Okay. So this thing can bind to these sites as well. Now the problem is, uh, this is a ubiquitous protein and there are 5,000 binding sites for the CLAMP protein in the genome, on the autosomes everywhere. So obviously CLAMP is not the solution to the specificity problems. Uh, nevertheless, we explored uh, the contribution. And the first thing we did is we repeated an experiment that Erica had done in flies in tissue culture cells. That is, we knocked down the clamp protein and then we monitored the binding of MSL2. You see these peaks here, right? Let's look at this here. Here are all the peaks, the binding of MSL2, all the, all the binding sites in this kind of a heat map, right? And if we knock down the clamp, binding is gone. As a control, we also knocked down the Drosophila Gaga factor that uh, Dr. Tariq may still remember. And, um, and there's no effect here, right? Uh, but I'll get, get back to that later. Gaga factor will play a role later. But for now, CLAMP is actually really important. And so the idea that we came up with is, well, perhaps it's the following situation. MSL2 tries to bind its high affinity sites but they are occluded by nucleosomes. And the clamp, because it has so many zinc fingers and so forth, for some reason is able to bind the sequences and keeps chromatin open. And then the MSL2 can take advantage of this, right? And so we looked for chromatin accessibility at these high affinity sites. And the method that we used is called attack seek and you must not know about this. This is a method, me method that reveals accessible chromatin. And in detail, how it works is you use, it's actually a beautiful method. It works right away for a small number of cells. I can only recommend it. Um, you use a, uh, a, an integrase, a transposon integrase that integrates little, uh, DNA sequences, DNA oligonucleotides into accessible chromatin. Only when the chromatin is accessible, this enzyme, actually you have to do this on isolated nuclei, then add the enzyme, enzyme is loaded with DNA, it will integrate into accessible chromatin. So you will have all the accessible sites uh, uh, furnished with uh, oligonucleotides and that can be PCR amplified in the end. So, here, we are looking at the accessibility at high affinity sites. I should say that we had shown earlier that they are nucleosome free. So normally in vivo, they are nucleosome free. So here you see accessibility. If you, the change of accessibility, if you remove the clamp and you see the accessibility of all these 300 sites is reduced. Anything below zero means less accessibility, chromatin closes, right? So clamp, if you remove it, accessibility at the high affinity sites is reduced. The same is actually true, and that was a surprise, if you knock down MSL2. You know, all these high affinity sites lose, you know, they are closed. We had assumed that clamp would open up sites and MSL2 would profit. Now we actually find that the effect, and that can be is compared here, of MSL2 and clamp uh, is very similar. And so the conclusion now is that both of these proteins synergize. They both contribute to keep chromatin open at these sites and somehow fight the battle against nucleosome assembly. And if either one of them is depleted, is removed, then the other one by itself cannot uh, keep the chromatin open. I should say there are exceptions. In our paper that was published also late last year, th there are a couple of binding sites where MSL2 is the dominant component. In brackets, these are the pioneer sites. 
uh, but it, most of all, there is this cooperation. And we also showed that there is a physical interaction of MSL2 with clamp, and we've mapped the interaction surfaces. And you can actually see the interaction uh, in, with soluble proteins, but uh, is probably also promoted by binding to DNA. Okay, so there is one element. However, there is a problem, as you will see, because, yeah, you will see, there is a problem here. So, the protein clamp cooperates. This is a beautiful example where a very general, ubiquitous, all over the place protein is used by a very specific process, high affinity site binding, uh, for cooperation, right? Clamp presumably cooperates with many other factors in promoters and enhancers elsewhere. Clamp is perhaps a general cooperating factor. Um, uh, but MSL2, the dosage compensation machinery, has co-opted it, selected it during evolution as a partner to keep these sites open. So um, we have um, done the genome-wide DIP assays as well in the presence of CLAMP to see whether now CLAMP improves the binding to the high affinity sites. And that was not the case in naked DNA because CLAMP binds 5,000 sites all over the genome and CLAMP on naked DNA recruits MSL2 to the autosomal sites. You know, if you just have a genome, small fragments, there's no chromosome, there's, there's just DNA. And so for CLAMP, it doesn't matter whether this is X chromosome or what. Uh, so we actually did not see an improvement of specificity. Uh, so even though we have shown in vivo, there is cooperation, um, something else is lacking. And so this something else may be chromatin. And uh, for those of you who know me, um, actually I'm, I'm a chromatin guy. So of course we always want to do the chromatin analysis. Okay, um, so um, we know that a critical time in development is these pre plastoderm chromatin. This is when the genome in its chromatin organization is structured. Before that, we have um, a relatively, how shall I say, open, in, inactive in, with respect to transcription chromatin. There's not a lot of structural variation. All the interesting regulators are not present and so forth. Um, but then uh, at the time of cellularization and when the whole interesting morphogenesis happens and differentiation, this is when everything is, uh, is assembled and stratified. And so we have actually, I have a little private um, goal in my life. I'd like to reconstitute this phenomenon in vitro. Um, and actually, when I when I was a group leader at EMBL uh, some you know decades ago, I can't remember. Um, it was actually my research proposal to reconstitute pre-plastoderm Drosophila development in a test tube, and that was totally loony and nothing worked. Of course, it was a total failure. But but now uh, towards the end of my career, we are picking it up again because now we have different methods. So um, ah, it turns out that. These early embryos are super active. Uh, they are super active in terms of chromatin assembly. They uh, do replication and so forth. They contain all the components that you need to make beautiful chromatin. And even uh, during my postdoc time with Carl Wu, again, many years ago, um, uh, I developed an extract from these early embryos uh, that is one of the most efficient chromatin assembly extracts, and it assembles uh, highly active chromatin. So what we are doing here, and here you see me handling the cage, because this is actually the only thing that I can still do in my lab, uh, you know, these chromatin stuff, because I did it as a postdoc in, published in 1992. Um, so we have this embryo factory 15 such large case, cage, each case with 40,000 
multiplies and then they lay eggs onto apple juice agar plates that are sprinkled with a yeast paste, a live yeast paste. So they eat the yeast, of course, and then they lay their embryos onto these plates. And we can, you know, overnight embryos, we can get 50 grams, 100 grams in the week. But we can also get pre-blastoderm embryos. And so we can get about 5, 10 grams uh, in two days or so. Uh, and so just by putting in the plates and removing them after an hour, we get these early embryos. And we prepare an extract from that. And this extract can be used for chromatin assembly. Uh, I just show you here for the chromatin aficionados. This is a, a classical assay, how you monitor chromatin, microcockle nucleus digestion. These uh, ladder of bands shows you the regularity of nucleosomes, the beads on a string conformation. And it is uh, of super quality all of the time. Um, uh, the pre plastoderm chromatin does not contain H1, but we can titrate it in and then we get a, a lengthening of the repeat length and so forth. Now, importantly, this chromatin is super complex. So my colleague Axel Imhoff here has done the proteomic analysis of it. And so there are 5000 proteins in it. So this is really physiological chromatin. Uh, and it is dynamic, and it is this chromatin where all the ATP-dependent nucleosome remodeling factors were identified. Nucleosome sliding was first found. It is this highly dynamic chromatin. And so we think this is highly appropriate for reconstitutions. In the past, we have used plasmids uh, to reconstitute chromatin. The innovation that I'm explaining now is we are doing this on a genome-wide scale. We take Drosophila genome, uh, as we purify it through kits, uh, it usually comes out as fragments of 50 to 100 kilobases. So it's a mixture of, let's say, 100 KB fragments. And then we put it in the system and allow the system to assemble chromatin. And um, I'll show you the results in a minute. But before that, I will just uh, move down the shades a bit um, so I'm not blinded so much anymore. Now I'm blinded by a different shade. Okay, so um, actually it's interesting to consider how this chromatin would look like, right? And so we looked at it under the microscope and, and this is actually interesting here. You see these um, condensates now, I'm, I'm not trying to jump on the condensation phase separation bandwagon. Uh, this is not lipid, li li uh, uh, liquid, liquid phase separation. This is the well-known property of, um, of polymer phase separation. It is pretty clear that, of course, chromatin condenses. Um, but it was interesting for us, and we will actually study this uh, um, once uh, the new staff has arrived that couldn't arrive due to corona. Um, but these things are actually nucleus sized. Some of these bigger things are the size of a nucleus. So they contain many fragments of about 100 KB, right? And um, uh, what is um, what, what I found totally interesting is that, of course, if we consider we are putting one microgram of DNA in a test tube and we assemble chromatin, then we calculate the, the density of this chromatin. And of course, the idea is, is this physiological at all? And when we just calculate, you know, back of the envelope, we come to conclude that the chromatin is about 10,000 fold less concentrated than in vivo. But of course, if we now consider that there are these condensates, then we are pretty sure that in these con condensates, we have fairly physiological chromatin con uh, concentrations. And so whatever I'm going to show you now has to be seen as a system where we are really trying to mimic the physiological chromatin uh, state, right? So now to this chromatin, we are adding the components that we would like to study, MSL2, CLAMP, what have you. And we're trying to see whether they're able to bind their binding sites, right? And um, so let me show you just this as an example. Uh, we are mapping nucleosome positions genome-wide. Uh, 
we are blending the omic type of analysis with biochemistry, right? This is what we are doing is pure biochemistry. But because we have this genome-wide angle, it becomes an omic procedure. Here, for example, we are mapping all the nucleosomes of the genome, but here we are aligning them to a transcription factor binding site. And obviously the transcription factor is present in the system. Uh, the, the dark shows you uh, open chromatin, and then here the reddish uh, lines are actually the nucleosomes that line up next to the transcription factor binding site. Uh, it's also illustrated here to the right. So uh, this is a protein. We know from my own early studies, but many other people's studies, that in this system, uh, there are ATP-dependent remodeling activity, sliding activity that actually move nucleosomes. And as soon as a protein binds tightly, it will constitute a boundary to which the nucleosomes are lined up, right? And this is called nucleosome phasing. Um, and, and you can see this here. We've actually first um, uh, uh, introduced the genome analysis in a paper about two years ago, uh, where we actually analyzed phasing and so forth. Uh, here, um, so the remarkable thing is, we are adding the transcription factors, the proteins we are interested in, to fully reconstituted chromatin. Right, And it is the ATP-dependent dynamic state of that chromatin that allows transcription factors to bind. So this example here that I'm showing is actually adding the CLAMP protein to, uh, to the system. CLAMP is absent um, you know, in the system. It's a pre-plastoderm system, there's no CLAMP. And you can see if we map nucleosomes on the 4,000 or so clamp sites, nothing happens. But if now if we add the clamp protein, it binds. And now this is, you know, after chromatin is assembled, now we're adding the protein. Now the nucleosomes realign to all these clamp binding sites. Now you can see the dynamic movement of nucleosomes. This depends on ATP dependent uh, uh, nucleosome sliding of factors of the I-switch family, crack, ACF, and NERF, that we showed 30 years ago are present in this system. Okay, but for us, this is a huge success. We can add proteins and they bind chromatin and so forth. So now we are mapping by in vitro chromatin chip. And so this uh, a browser screenshot, we read from the bottom. There are Pionex sites here, the little ticks, and there are high affinity sites here, the blue ticks here. They are nicely spread all over the genome. And the green lines here are in vivo chips, right? In vivo chips, where you see the high affinity sites are bound, and then uh, you also spread into neighboring chromatin. This depends on how you do the binding, whether you use micrococcal nucleus or DNA shearing. And this is now the blue that I want to highlight is the chromatin immune precipitation of in vitro reconstituted chromatin. MSL2 alone and the clamp protein. Right? There'll be no, no to synergize. And you see quite a nice correspondence. If you look at this now genome-wide, again, we look at this from the bottom. The, the lowest, here you see all the chromosomes lined up with the X chromosome. Here we see the peaks. In vivo chip, the binding is essentially localized to the X, as you've seen in the immunofluorescence. There are a couple of known autosomal sites that we can see as well. You can also see them by um, immunofluorescence on polytene chromosomes. Now, here is our reconstitute. So the first thing is, this is what I shown to you, X chromosomal binding, actually quite a nice correspondence. So this is actually great. What is not so great is that we still have many binding events on the autosomes in vitro that are not supposed to be there, uh, in, or that are not present in vivo. Now, um, well, perhaps you could say not surprising 
because anyway, there's no chromosomal contingency and so forth. This is a mixture of fragments. Um, nevertheless, of course, we wonder why are these autosomal sites bound? So there's something missing to repress the autosomal sites. Of course, I had assumed, assumed this would be nucleosomes. And when it was not nucleosomes, I told the PhD student, why, why don't you add H1? And that didn't make a big of a di bit difference. And so the question is, what could it be? So um, we now consider another protein that is known to bind GAGA sequences, namely the GAGA factor that is long known since decades as a protein that binds these kind of GAGA sequences. It oligomerizes, it also is ubiquitous. It binds to many sequences in the genome, thousands again. And the binding sites are frequently in promoters and polycomb response elements and so forth. Uh, Renato Paro actually, uh, Mohamed, you know, uh, um, yeah, this was the time when the Gaga factor was interesting for yeah. you as well. So um, we, we, are, um, we are introducing the Gaga factor into the system. And here is how this works. We express the Gaga factor and then we added increasing amount, we titrated it into the reconstituted uh, genome. Um, biochemistry, right? You can add low, medium, and high levels. This is actually 25 nanomolar is about uh, the, the concentration of what we have as clamp protein and MSL2 protein. Um, and um, we titrate it in. We monitor the chip to all the GAGA factor binding sites. We can see it happens. And then we do the MSL2 chip and on, on many of the sites, you actually lose the binding of MSL2, right? So uh, if we now focus on the sites that are interesting to us, namely the high affinity sites, these are the 309 high affinity sites. So the heat map shows only 300 lines rather than a couple of thousand. You see the Gaga factor binds not so well, but it still binds to many of those. But the good high affinity sites are, uh, by comparison, less affected. Right? And so you can see this actually also nicely. And this is unpublished data. Actually, to be honest, we only have one replicate of this experiment. And we're just waiting for the sequencing of the other replicates that we need for publication. But the data are so beautiful that they will only become more beautiful. You can see. Here is, let's look at the second. These are, these are uh, the uh, proper binding sites of MSL2 all over the place on, um, on autosomes. And um, whenever you have a Gaga factor binding peak here, the red, you lose MSL2 binding, like here. But whenever you have no Gaga factor binding peak, you keep MSL2 binding. So, and you can see this here nicely as well. Now, uh, the same, so actually, it turns out that the Gaga factor competes for clamp, for the binding sites. And wherever Gaga factor binds, at least in vitro, uh, it will actually prevent clamp and therefore also MSL2 for binding. And you see this, the same is of course true also for X chromosomal sites that are not high affinity sites. This is now on the X chromosome. Look here, uh, wherever Gaga factor binds, we, re we see a reduction of MSL2 binding and wherever it does not bind, uh, the binding is retained. And so these are the high affinity sites. Uh, look at this, this is super interesting. The high affinity site is here. There is a double peak. The Gaga factor binds to the left peak and the left peak is reduced, but the high affinity site peak is still maintained. It's actually quite nice. So if we now look at chromosomal enrichment, uh, here you see the genome, all the different chromosomes, X chromosome, 2L, 2R, 3L, 3R. Here you see them, the fourth chromosome, okay? This is how the, the, the sequences distribute to the chromosome. If we just take MSL2 and let it select binding sites or naked DNA, we still get a nice enrichment. MSL2 
binds MRE sequences. This was one of the first experiments I've shown you. And some of these are pionex sites, but there's still, it selects sequences on the X chromosome. In chromatin, actually, the, uh, the selectivity is improved because now the peaks that are retained are much more robust and many of the small peaks are suppressed. This has actually a lot to do with peak calling, which I find a totally mysterious and frightening process, to be honest. Um, now, if we add the clamp protein, the specificity is reduced because the clamp now actually pulls MSL2 to autosomal sites. But the peaks that we obtain are much, much more robust. By the way, you should look at the number of peaks here. In the presence of clamp, we get over 500 robust peaks, right? If we now add the Gaga factor under the same conditions and peak calling is the same, we drastically reduce the number of sites from 500 something to about 90. But these 90 sites are enriched, I don't know, 80% or so on the X chromosome. So I think... Uh, we have discovered a couple of important principles here. Um, uh, chromatin provides a competitive environment for factor binding. MSL2 has an intrinsic activity for GA-rich sequences. And we know that in particular, the CXC domain has specificity for the, the best sites on the X chromosome. Now, MSL2 cooperates with the ubiquitous protein CLAMP and the GAGA factor competes with CLAMP. And so in the end, um, by, a, by competition and uh, cooperation, we can see in reconstitutes some level of specificity. However, I should also say that if you look at this, uh, this is by far not complete. Uh, th th this is not as robust and this is not as, as complete as uh, in vivo. And so the question is, um, what is what is missing? I need to finish now. So um, we think what is missing is the contribution, presumably, of other dosage compensation subunits. We, we also know that this thing is presumably a dimer. And so there is potential for cooperativity even within the same complex that we have so far not explored. But what we are doing at the moment is uh, we are trying to, we are reconstituting this complex uh, from all the subunits. We are trying to put in the non-coding RNA because we also think that there will be an effect of the non-coding RNA as an allosteric effector of all the activities of the dosage compensation complex, including DNA binding. Um, I, but I will, I will not spend more time on this because I've exhausted my time. And so I will actually flip uh, to uh, my acknowledgement slides. Hope, uh, and, and I will just show my team. It's slightly smaller now because people left and the newcomers haven't arrived. Uh, I just want to highlight uh, Nick Eggers, who has done all the in vitro reconstitute, uh, Christian Albig, who done all the um, reconstitutes on naked DNA, and uh, Rafi Villa, who has worked on this for all the time. Uh, he, she discovered the Pionex sites, and uh, she has an interesting new story coming up uh, where actually non coding RNA plays a role. And um, I thank you so much for your patience and for your attention. I'm sorry I, I went much over time, but if there were still some people interested, I, I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Um, I have, um, um, for me, it's after breakfast and not before lunch. Thank you for the invitation. I cannot hear thank you. Very, thank you very much, Peter, for an excellent talk. I'm overwhelmed to see. I think we have uh, uh, time for questions. So questions, please go ahead. So we have a question from Hina. Hina, you can unmute your mic and ask. Uh, 
Thank you for uh, such a nice and informative talk. So my question is about the ub E3 ubiquitin ligase nature of MSL2. So you talk about it. So if it is E3 ubiquitin ligase, it should put a ubiquitin mark. So can you explain what is the role of this ubiquitin mark or the nature of ubiquitin ligase in this whole process of dosage compensation? Yes, uh, thank you, Hina, for the question. Um, um, I find ubiquitination extremely complicated. Um, nevertheless, I believe it somehow plays a role. And we've published two papers on this. Uh, the one where we first monitored ubiquitination uh, on the MSL proteins, on all the subunits of the complex in vitro. And we also and so I think the idea that we uh, developed at the time, this was five years, six years ago, was that this is a quality control. If the complex is not uh, nicely assembled or if the stoichiometry of components is not right, uh, MSL2 will ubiquitulate and that may lead to the degradation of everything. Uh, if you uh, inhibit the proteasome in vivo, you increase the number of dosage compensation complex and it will actually uh, move over from the X chromosome to the autosome. This once again shows that this is all tightly balanced and when we titrate components in vitro um, in the biochemical manner, actually uh, this is what happens in, in vivo as well. The, the system is titrated. However, we also published in a borderline difficult experiment that we can detect uh, ubiquitulation in steady state on proteins that bind the X chromosome. So we somehow still hypothesize that some of these marks are not degradation marks, but rather, I don't know, signaling mar marks. Um, and, um, of, and we do not know. Um, it is also possible that uh, MSL2 um, ubiquitulates other components, for example, components of the transcription machinery. And we have an unpublished ubiquitulome experiment where we found some elongation factors. And we haven't followed this up. This is super complicated. You know, ubiquitulation is a system that is very difficult to pinpoint. And if your main effect is less than twofold, and if there is redundancy of ubiquitulation sites, is, this is super tricky. Um, so we have not been able to um, functionally or to, to uh, associate a function of any specific particular ubiquitulation sites. And we published a whole plus one paper on MOF ubiquitulation where we mutated you know, essentially half of the protein, all the lysines gone, where we actually did not see an effect of mutating lysines, uh, even though they are nicely ubiquitulated um, in, in vitro and in vivo. So the mystery is still, uh, is still a mystery. Thank you. Um, so I have another question. So you talked about in your conclusion, one came, um, the acetylation is the main factor that creates a difference between the st early stage and uh, the late stage. If uh, MSL2 complex is there and all the components are there, what is the main differentiating component that decides that in early stage, um, how I should say it, in early stage, uh, there shouldn't be the dosage compensation and in late stage, there should be a dosage compensation. What is the deciding component or deciding factor? Um, I, this, is, this is difficult to know. Uh, our observation is that uh, the, Im the improvement of dosage compensation at later times correlates with a maturation of chromosome folding somehow by high C. And so the idea is that uh, the genes that are less compensated because they are less acetylated are further away 
from the recruitment sites to the high affinity sites. Um, and if they are further away, then they rely on chromatin folding to get into proximity to the chromosome bound complex. And so the genes that are late are later compensated are more further away and they rely more on chromosome folding. I think this is a very nice idea and I don't think there's any argument against it, uh, but uh, there's also no formal proof for that. Thank you, Peter. That's all from my side. Thank you so much. Any other questions? Or I should ask questions. I have a question. So, um, Dr. Peter, thank you for the nice talk. Uh, my question is that you talked about other factors which are um, which may be involved in MSL2 binding to the X chromosome. However, in vitro, you see other sites on the autosomes as well. So uh, how do you exclude the possibility of uh, specificity that is assigned um, by maybe other uh, proteins to MSL in vivo? Because uh, we don't know as yet that what could be the protein that will help the MSL2 in identifying the specific binding site in vivo. Uh, yes. You may not yes. have added the, those proteins in vitro. Yeah. Thank you, Naima. I think you, you really uh, picked the weak spot of the biochemical analysis because we can only analyze what we know, right? I mean, we know about the GAGA factor, we know about nucleosome remodeling factors and so forth. The, the way to discover new components is are of course screens. And uh, there have been numerous genetic screens have been conducted and they have saturated the genome multiple times. And so there are no components anymore that are kind of male specific. Having said that, uh, the clamp protein, for example, was not discovered uh, in such a screen because clamp is ubiquitously important. And if you mutate it, it's a lethal condition. And because it is not only involved in dosage compensation, but also presumably helps other transcription factors to bind to enhancer elements and so forth. So um, CLAMP uh, has been identified in screens, in proteomic screens. So that's, that's kind of the, 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 the third possibility. Um, a, a screen, for example, by uh, Mitzi Kuroda called XLMS, where she immunoprecipitates complex yeah. and then by mass spectrometry it's cross-linked by mass mm. uh, spectrometry um, uh, finds all the components and the clamp was among them and um, so there are still um, a couple of interesting proteins there that could be tested and some have been evaluated um, and so I think it would be this could be a resource to actually look for other factors. Um, and, and there may be some. Um, for us, the priority now is to actually reconstitute the dosage compensation complex properly because there we know components, right? I mean, we've so far only done the recombinant MSL2 protein, but there's no dimerization, there's no non-coding RNA. In such a complex, there may be all kinds of interesting um, yeah. allosteric uh, interactions that for us, this is the most logical next step. And this is already a big task, to be honest. Um, but we are committed to doing this. We are also interested in, in the epigenetic components. So we are beginning to ask, is the complex able now to reach out to K36 methylated nucleosomes? Is the acetylation facilitated by K36 methylation. You know, there are all kind of interesting uh, implications of the simple model that I've shown. Uh, it, is, it is totally unclear why a single methyl mark on K36 should have such an exquisite specificity that all the acetylation goes there. Even there may be other components. So for us, before we, we implement 
all kind of other components, we, we first try to assemble the complex and repeat the analysis with all the proteins and ideally with a non-coding RNA as well. Another uh, question following the same uh, thought of possibility that how do you exclude the possibility that the in vitro recombinant MSL2 has the same wild type conformation as it gets in the in vivo, uh, like in the wild type conformation? Because that may also uh, help in specific binding of the MSL, uh, I think, I believe. So how do you exclude that? Because in vitro, it may not get properly folded or something like that. Yeah. Um, I, th I think you are totally right. Um, we cannot assume at all that all the MSL2 is properly folded, in particular, since in vivo, it is always present in a complex. And all these proteins have intrinsically disordered domains that uh, presumably only fold when they are in the complex. So at the moment, um, th this is why we must build up the complex and we have some structural studies going on and we have some, um, I I'm just uh, stop sharing so I can see more of you on the screen. Um, so um, we, we are trying to map the conformation and it is indeed one of the questions whether we reconstitute the complex or have individual MSL2. Will the functional readout change? Will the conformation change and so forth? We have made one interest and it's also possible of course that um, the um, uh, MSL2 is modified uh, in vivo. Uh, we know it can be acetylated by MOF, right? MOF acetylates histones, but it also acetylates a ton of other proteins, including uh, proteins from the complex. The same is true for ubiquitylation. We've actually made the interesting observation that's unpublished that MSL2, the E3 ligase, will ubiquitylate the RNA helicase, MLE. Sorry. Yes, it will, but only in the presence of RNA. So um, you can see that there is an enormous possibility for missing important aspects. And this is why we are so excited when we see a positive result. Um, namely, we can explain something. The, the nature of the biochemical analysis is, or the reconstitution is, if it doesn't work, you cannot conclude. But if it works, you can conclude that the components that you put into your system uh, gave you that effect. With a note of caution that the extract and the chromatin that we are using is a complex system. So there may even be unknown components in there that contribute to the success that we are having and we don't know about them. And so what we will do in the future is we'll try to um, uh, device strategies to manipulate this uh, reconstitution system as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, Peter, uh, I have two quick questions. So one is, uh, uh, is it possible if we ectopically tether ROX RNA uh, somewhere else in the genome, uh, whether we constitute uh, MSL binding sites in on autosomes if we ectopically tether this. I think people must have done this experiment. So I'm, I'm just thinking in, in this uh, term. Uh, it will be really interesting to see how by bringing in rocks in this uh, in vitro constitutive chromatin uh, contributes to specificity. I'm, I'm really um, I'm watching from you. It's always, uh, it's, it's like Bible of biochemistry to see in vitro reconstitution of the chromatin and then see specificity by having CLAM, then MSL, and then, you know, slowly you're going to bring in complex. So if in vitro, if we ectopically tether rocks on autosomes and if it can reconstitute, if it can reconstitute uh, binding sites for dosage compensation complex in vivo, do you expect uh, it will enhance or increase specificity in your in vitro assays as well? Yeah. 
Um, um, well, ROX has not been uh, tethered uh, so far, but what has been done is that um, uh, the, the, the gene has been um, uh, transplanted, integrated into an autosome. And of course, one of the, I, I should have said ROX, um, uh, sorry, I, I, uh, I, I want, um, so ROX, uh, the name comes from the word RNA on the X. So the two ROX genes are on the X chromosome. And of course it is the idea, one of the ideas is that if ROX is transcribed on the X, kind of tethered, right? But it is there. Uh, the complex will immediately assemble around the site and that will be in the X chromosomal territory, right? And so forth. And um, so if you do this, and this is uh, done by Mitsuko Roda 20 years ago, and I think there will be a publication by Asifa Akta uh, coming on in the next uh, couple of weeks on this, uh, you actually generate uh, in the vicinity of the integration site, uh, a patch of dosage compensated chromatin. So I think this is the kind of experiments that you are mentioning. Yeah. And so indeed, this is the case. And as regards the, uh, the, the biochemistry of rocks, uh, I just want to highlight uh, this paper here that has been published a couple of weeks ago in nucleic acid research, where we are trying to uh, incorporate rocks RNA into the complex. And what is remarkable is that, um, uh, and, and here we are actually using the power of omics again for a biochemical analysis. We are confronting the RNA helicase MLE with the total RNA of a cell. Actually, in this case, only the total RNA of a nucleus. And then we allow it to in vitro uh, bind to it and we do an RNA immunoprecipitation, we call this VITRIP. And uh, then we study the intrinsic uh, affinity of the helicase MLE to RNA. And then in a second step, we monitor how MLE here down here incorporates the RNA into the complex. And it turns out that there is a selectivity element in the other proteins notably in MSL2. So MSL2, the protein that has the specific DNA binding also has a specific RNA binding and, um, and MLE has some selectivity as well. So if you're interested in that, you can look at this. Now, the problem is, the problem is that this biochemical um, process so far in our hands is not so efficient yet. And for, for uh, structural studies and functional studies, we need to be able to generate complex that has, I don't know, 50% is RNA loaded and so forth. And this is the main efforts in the lab to actually get to such a situation. Interestingly, and this can be actually seen here. No, it cannot be seen, I took this out. Interestingly, all these components here can be assembled totally in the absence of RNA. There is no RNA required as a scaffold to hold the complex together. So the RNA must have a very interesting, presumably modulatory, conformational, allosteric role. And uh, so we are trying to sort this out, but I can tell you this is really difficult. Other questions? Abdullah, are there other questions? Uh, no, sir. Okay, let me thank then Peter. Peter, thank you very much. It was really a pleasure. And uh, I think it, it, it was a rare opportunity for us to have you uh, with us because I think it, it was difficult. This is the first ever time I believe you're talking to an audience in Pakistan. And, uh, well, and, and, and that, that of course was a, a very special uh, treat as well. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm also deprived of such opportunities these days, but I think this may be an opportunity, these kind of opportunities may survive, uh, you know, the, 
corona pandemic. And, and this is actually something where we as scientists can actually communicate uh, much better now that we all learned that Zoom exists and how it works. Um, I'm looking forward to many more such opportunities. And I thank you very much again for this kind invitation. It is an honor and it was a pleasure. And of course, a good opportunity for me also to tell you about comments. Please feel free to contact me by mail and any of the other means. Thank, Thank you, you, Peter. We will certainly uh, bother you more than often. <clears throat> in future as well, we'll get back to you to invite you in these seminar series because, uh, you know, having authorities like you